All right, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us uh, for the CCF Speaker Series. Uh, it is my honor and privilege, and I'm very excited to um, have Dr. John Comer, who's a member of the Center for Children and Families, so came, comes very far all the way from Broward uh, to visit us um, this uh, afternoon. So uh, I won't take up too much of our time. I'll just remind everyone that this is being recorded um, and will be posted on the CCF website afterwards. Um, and with that, uh, I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. John Comer, who many of you already know. Uh, he completed his BA at the University of Rochester and uh, received his MS and his PhD in clinical psychology from Temple University. Uh, he completed his clinical internship at the NYU Child Study Center, followed by a T32 postdoc at Columbia University, after which he joined the faculty at Boston University as a research assistant professor, uh, and then joined the faculty here at FIU as an associate professor in 2013, and is currently a full professor of psychology and psychiatry uh, in the Department of Psychology and the Center for Children and Families. He directs the Mental Health Intervention and Technology program here, and he uh, is on a number of editorial boards of multiple top-tier journals and is the incoming editor-in-chief of Behavior Therapy, also an associate editor for a number of uh, journals as well. He is a fellow of APA, the Society of Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology, the Society for Child and Family Policy and Practice, and the Society of Clinical Psychology. He has over 200 publications, and his work has been funded by a number of different agencies, including NIH, IES, PCORI, American Psychological Foundation, uh, and his research program is devoted to expanding the quality and scope and accessibility of mental health care for youth and families. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, just uh, to announce some fake news, I've never had funding from IES, uh, but I would, I would love to someday. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, I've probably never presented in front of so many uh, friends and collaborators and, and colleagues. So uh, it's a uh, real pleasure to, to be here today. Um, all right, well, I'll just uh, start by just saying some disclosures. I earn royalties from uh, Macmillan Publishing and, and editorial stipends from, from ABCT. Uh, and Joe mentioned some of the funding. You'll notice IES is not here. Um, <laughs> And um, I want to acknowledge everything that I present today is a uh, collaborative group uh, effort. Uh, this is um, the Mint group that, that um, uh, Joe mentioned. This is uh, my lab, past and present. Um, none of this work could be possible. And in fact, a lot of this work has been led by people on this list, as well as a number of key uh, collaborators um, at other departments. Uh, as Joe mentioned, I have a, a few different areas of, of research. Um, so a lot of my work focuses on the treatment of youth mental health problems, uh, particularly anxiety disorders, but also early child conduct problems uh, and traumatic stress. And then a lot of my work focuses on using technology to expand the reach and the accessibility uh, and also the uh, scope of mental health care. And uh, another area is focusing on the psychological impact of disasters uh, on kids and families. So today I'm going to talk about uh, my work focusing on technology and expanding the, uh, the scope of mental health care, but it sort of overlaps with some of these other areas as well. So presenting here, this feels like a silly slide to even present on uh, the um, tremendous uh, public health burden of mental health problems, both at an individual, family, and society level. Um, so instead of going through all of the um, statistics about how prevalent and common and impairing uh, mental health problems are when they present in youth. Um, I'll just present this slide, which I think sums up speaking here uh, today on children's mental health problems. So the good news is, um, <coughs> excuse me, the good news is uh, over the past several decades, we've uh, had tremendous progress in the development and the evaluation and the classification of uh, a number of evidence-based uh, treatment protocols that have been shown to work in uh, research settings, and um, uh, this is the packaging of, of a number of tremendous evidence-based principles. So that's the good news. We now have um, a very sizable literature to, um, uh, to feel good about, but the bad news is we're not reaching people. Uh, we're not reaching kids with our treatments. We're not reaching um, the larger population of kids in need of mental health. Uh, services. So I could sort of summarize a bunch of the key ones. Um, so we have these unacceptable and widening disparities in care. 
uh, quality care tends to cluster, as we know, in major metropolitan regions and academic hubs, and particularly underserved are rural communities, low-income communities, uh, communities of color, and we also have this large person power imbalance in the field. Um, Alan Kazin once estimated that even if we were to double or even triple the um, the size of the mental health workforce, we still wouldn't even be making a meaningful dent uh, when we think of in, in comparison uh, to the um, striking number of, of uh, individuals in need. There's also issues of stigma. Uh, people, um, uh, many, many people are hesitant about um, acknowledging mental health problems or going to a mental health facility to get formal services transportation barriers, some people want treatment and have no way to get there. And among those who do access care, there are long wait lists at underfunded clinics, outcome gaps uh, sort of persist, so the, the great outcomes that we were sort of summarizing a second ago. In research settings, we don't see those outcomes comparably in community care settings and, and frontline settings. Um, and then also we see poor maintenance and generalizability of the gains as well. So this was all before COVID. And then, um, as we all know, uh, looking out here at a sea of masks, um, the world changed uh, about, well, I guess, 19 months ago, maybe. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, mental health care, uh, as traditionally defined, was out of reach um, for virtually the entire population. So it's really been a time to sort of reevaluate what is mental health care, what, is, what are mental health supports, um, and our formats for delivering mental health care and supports to individuals in need. And you'll notice all of our traditional mental health models are in person, they're office-based. So people have to leave their sort of natural settings and come to our offices to, to receive mental health care. Um, there's a famous bank robber. I don't even know if this is a real quote, um, but famously a reporter asked him at one of his bookings, uh, his name is Willie Sutton, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. So if, if Willie Sutton was a clinical psychologist, he would not be treating kids in mental health clinics because that's not where the kids are, that's not where the people in need are. He would be thinking about treating people in non-mental health settings, so where they are. So we see schools uh, where so many people in this, this audience are conducting uh, great research, pediatric and primary care settings, and the home settings, these are where people naturally congregate. Um, there are also, I know a lot of people uh, in this, this group working in after school settings and parks and recreation. So kids are not naturally in mental health clinics. So when we think about providing supports, um, we wanna also be thinking about expanding uh, the scope of where we're providing those services. So this work is, is um, that can be very expensive and, and resource expensive and, and person power expensive. Uh, some time ago, we all know the internet um, came about and it uh, sort of trans, we were allowed to um, um, overcome so many of the geographical obstacles in, in all aspects of life, not just mental health care, and, and reach people with the same sort of speed and facility uh, on even the opposite side of the globe with the same. Um, uh, a facility that we have in in-person uh, interactions. So the idea of telehealth is not very new. Uh, we go back to 1924. This is the first um, sort of published uh, uh, mention of what we now sort of think of as telemedicine or telehealth. Uh, this was a magazine called Radio News. It was like sort of science fiction, sort of real. It's kind of creepy. But um, there were, they came up with the idea of the radio doctor. And they had this device, which the specifics were not um, articulated. But this is the teledactyl, which uh, I think means, I looked it up, the sort of pieces, and I think it means long arms. So basically, the physician was able to clearly do something, and then they were able to provide medical care to someone who was in a mirror somewhere else. So this was the cover of that, but so already people were thinking about using technology to remotely um, reach people with needed healthcare services. And I could go through a whole sort of discussion of the history of how technology has always been incorporated in mental health care. Um, in the interest of time, you know, I'll just say we've always, you know, in the 1950s when, you know, after World War II, we had affordable uh, household telephones, then all of a sudden we started thinking about the emergence of first crisis lines and, and suicide prevention lines, um, you know, answering machines, beepers, they've all, we've always incorporated the latest technology into our routine practices. Um, 
incorporating technology into mental health care specifically. Uh, in 1973, the term telepsychiatry first appeared in the literature. Uh, Massachusetts General, Mass General in Boston was the first place to use uh, telehealth to remotely provide routine care. So an entire suite and clinic. They had a, um, a suite in the airport. So this is Boston. <laughs> um, so they had a suite in the airport and Mass General Boston traffic is really bad. So people would fly in for Mass General care and the doctors wouldn't leave their offices. And so that was the first time we saw a, a routine practice uh, working with telehealth. Um, so at first it was just for training and consultation purposes and then it got incorporated into uh, routine care. So this has been going on for many decades. Um, when we look at research, uh, actually researching the outcomes associated with technology and mental health care, uh, we see um, this is uh, some, some data, you know, it only goes up to 2014 here, but we see around 2004, 2005, the strong spike when all of a sudden everyone, uh, when all of a sudden we see this large leap in terms of um, who's, uh, how many studies we're, we're conducting on the use of technology to deliver mental health care. And that coincides with, of course, the, um, the percent of adults who use the internet regularly. Um, <coughs> as late as uh, 2018, we saw about 90% were. And of course, we have digital divides. Uh, but a lot of those digital divides are disappearing, not fast enough. But um, there is a, a lot of promising uh, trends suggesting that those are disappearing. Um, and then by age, too. So if we think about the families we work with, they tend to be uh, 50 and below if they have younger kids or even older kids. And um, we're seeing almost near ubiquity, even across um, race and ethnicity. Um, so digital divides are really um, are, are closing. And then the technology that people are using. Um, how are people accessing the internet? You know, decades ago, we had the mainframes and the personal computers. It was a big deal when people had PCs in their own home, desktop, internet, then mobile. Everyone had internet in their, their pocket. And then now we're in the age of wearable connectivity. So we see sensors, passive sensors. Um, we're also seeing um, embedded uh, um, technology. So uh, things are evolving. This is a picture of my daughter many years ago. Um, and we're at an airport and she picks this up and she's like, what is this? And we say, oh, it's a, you know, it's a phone. And she says, no, it's not. And she said, where's, where's it play the movies? So <laughs> technology definitely evolves and has new capabilities. Um, also, what are people doing online? Um, you know, when they, when they self-report, we see um, the third most common thing they're doing online is looking for health or medical information. So when I have some weird spot after I, show Jamie and say, what is this? I don't call my doctor. I Google weird spot on my arm. And no matter what it is, it always turns out it's, you know, I have days left. But, um, <laughs> but this is where people are naturally presenting for their, their health care. Um, the first, their first point of contact with, um, with trying to receive health care services. And this is, um, so when we think about treating people in their natural settings and spaces, the internet is a natural, and, and social media as well, is a natural place where people are um, presenting. Um, this was all before technology, or sorry, well, this was all before COVID uh, when this brought everything into, into the mainstream. So when we think about technology and mental health care, um, there's sort of two domains of, of advantages when we talk about the promise and the potential. So one is, of course, we have transformative opportunities to overcome traditional barriers to care. So we can reach communities that maybe don't have facilities in their area. We can overcome uh, disparities in uh, the mental health workforce regionally. Uh, we can overcome transportation obstacles. People can be treated in their homes. Maybe they have stigma or, or negative um, uh, ideas about going to a facility. And then in addition, so those are all about accessibility and reach. And then the other um, main uh, advantage that we talk about in the literature is we're expanding the ecological validity of treatment by treating families in their natural settings. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, that's different than just access. That's suggesting that there's a clinical value, not just to reaching people, um, overcoming barriers, but that even if they could come to the clinic, there's a value in uh, treating people where they're at. You know, when, when we're treating 
kids with separation anxiety disorder. It's one thing to say, here's my office, here's my couch in my office. Okay, you pretend that you're, this is your bed, mom and dad pretend you're you know, turning off the light. It's another thing to be able to provide direct support to families using the kid's real bed or if, or if they're having um, fights at the dinner table to be able to provide live support and live coaching directly in the very settings as opposed to trying to recreate it in, in the office setting. So how have innovators been applying technology? So um, in the beginning of technology-based treatments, a lot of the talk was, okay, is this an app or is it on the internet or is it a computer, is it a CD-ROM, uh, if any of you even know what that is anymore. So um, the main way, instead of thinking about what platform is it on, uh, people were thinking about now sort of what is the role of the therapist? And that's sort of a more meaningful way to um, parse this up. So we have uh, full therapist involvement programs where the therapist is involved in every moment of treatment with technology. And then we have standalone or no therapist involvement, so it's a completely self-administered program. And then we sort of have the middle, which is middle, uh, minimal therapist involvement. So there's a, a technology-based program. The therapist might be checking in, um, providing some sort of supportive coaching, but not, um, not using uh, the technology in, in real time with the patient. So here you can see, um, this is just our summary of the literature when we were looking at the 390 studies. Uh, we can see the largest amount of research is on standalone, no therapist involved, self-administered programs. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of um, evidence for, for each of these and talk about the, the pros and cons. So first I'm gonna talk about um, full therapist involvement. So this is, uh, here we're really talking about telehealth or telemedicine, where we're talking about the use of electronic media to facilitate real-time interactions for the provision of care usually delivered in person. So here we're talking about the therapist synchronous, uh, in a synchronous manner providing real-time care. A lot of different terms for this, um, behavioral telehealth, uh, telepsychiatry, telemental health uh, really caught on before COVID and everyone was calling it telemental health and now people just sort of refer to it as telehealth uh, more broadly. Uh, over the last 15 years, there's been lots of uh, clinical trials, all very supportive of telehealth. Um, and the fastest form of tele telemental health has been um, care delivered directly to families in their homes. So when treatment first started, it was about um, you know, rural area, when, when technology-based treatment first started, it was about reaching rural communities, and so you'd have a sort of telehealth suite, um, maybe at a primary care setting, and then you'd have a mental health facility in some sort of metropolitan hub or something, and they'd be remotely delivering to that primary care setting, but people still had to come to that primary care setting. And then as technology grew and accessibility uh, to in-home uh, internet has grown, uh, we're seeing all of the clinical trials really looking at the model of delivering mental health care directly to families in their home. So an example of telemental health care or telehealth uh, from our program is, has been internet-delivered uh, parent-child interaction therapy, or what we call IPCIT. So IPCIT, so uh, raise your hand if you um, have done PCIT. Right, so this is a very PCIT-centric program. Um, a lot of, lot of uh, crowds won't have as many people. Uh, and, and the rest of you, I assume, are pretty um, familiar with PCIT. Uh, so we started developing um, internet-delivered PCIT in uh, 2007. Traditionally, as, as all of you know, um, standard PCIT is delivered in the clinic uh, behind a one-way mirror. So, Decades ago, before there even was a, um, an internet, uh, Sheila Eiberg, who developed PCIT, separated the family from the therapist, and the idea <coughs> was um, intending to separate the family from the therapist to create as naturalistic a parent-child interaction as possible uh, in order to you know, not out-parent the parent um, and uh, really try to work on the naturalistic parent-child relationship as much as possible. So, the family is brought in, there's a playroom in front of the mirror, and then the therapist providing live coaching behind the mirror. Parents um, would wear, um, now they're Bluetooth earpieces, they used to be sort of walkie-talkie earpieces, and um, so only the parent can hear the therapist providing live parent coaching uh, in the moment. 
So as I mentioned, decades before there even was an internet, um, the family was separated from the therapist intentionally for, for um, strategic reasons. So our thinking was the family's already separated from the therapist, so instead of um, uh, doing the treatment from behind the mirror, uh, as, as the internet and video conferencing were starting to rise and people were able to uh, use devices in their own home and Bluetooth earpieces, uh, in their own home, we uh, started doing this over the internet. So instead of the family having to come to the clinic, uh, this was, uh, we were thinking, a way to reach new families. Here's sort of a screenshot of what internet-delivered PCIT would look like. Um, this would be probably from the therapist perspective, and you can see the therapist in the lower right. Um, some other screenshots you'll notice. For those of you who do PCIT, what are some things you notice that's different from the PCIT playroom? In, if you're doing clinic-based treatment. Does anything, uh, would Sheila Eiberg be happy before COVID with this picture? Okay, I'm seeing some no's. Uh, what do people see? Well, there's a huge window. Um, there's another huge window. Uh, I think that's a TV there. Uh, so in the PCIT, clinic-based PCIT, you, you know, everything has to be shatterproof. Uh, you know, oftentimes we're working with kids with some very serious conduct problems. You know, they can take a chair and throw it through a window. And in the clinic, we'd make sure that it was sort of a, a sterile environment where they couldn't um, destroy the property. So sometimes PCITers will say, you can't do PCIT here. But in truth, we're coaching them for an hour a week in the clinic. And then we're saying, now go home and do it and they don't have a PCIT um, a room at home, they have their house where they live their lives. So, um, you know, similarly, when we're trying to talk about um, timeout rooms, right? And we have a nice, perfectly built timeout room, maybe in the PCIT clinic, and then we say, now go home and find a, a, a timeout room, and then they come back and they say, couldn't find one, and we're like, oh, you're just, you know, not working hard enough, let's think, and, and you're working through it. But then when you're on the internet, you're like, there's no place to put a, a timeout room. So we're providing the support and the care directly to families in their home. So we were doing this clinically for a while, and then um, we uh, conducted our first RCT of IPCIT. So the types of kids we were working with were these types of kids. Um, kids with disruptive behavior problems. Most of my work is um, kids with uh, anxiety disorders, but in terms of a first step for um, evaluating internet uh, PCIT, uh, it made sense to go with um, kids with disruptive behavior problems, given that this was really where the treatment was uh, developed for originally. So we randomized kids to either get treated in the home, so that's on the right, clinic-based PCIT, or um, online, uh, internet-delivered PCIT. 50-50. Um, so in terms of how to do PCIT, internet PCIT and all that, that's a whole other talk, but um, I'll go through some of these effect sizes. The effect sizes were really strong. These are within condition effect sizes. So at post-treatment, we see very large effect sizes for improvements in behavior problems and caregiver burden, and um, also very large effect sizes at six-month follow-up. Global severity, we also saw large effect sizes. Um, so within treatment, um, uh, internet-delivered PCIT was, was uh, showing uh, a lot of promise in this pilot study. Here are the two conditions. Remember, families were randomized, and uh, I guess that's maroon on this screen, and teal? Does that look like that? For I'm testing my color. So, um, you know, we see very strong response rates. Comparable, these are not significant differences between condition. Uh, you can see that IPCIT more than held its own against uh, clinic-based PCIT, and then six-month follow-up, we also saw that maintained. So um, then, um, when we were submitting this for review, uh, re the, the main outcome, so this is response rates, was uh, based on the CGI, the Clinical Global Impression Scale, where a one or a two is very much improved or much improved. In a lot of large randomized controlled trials, that's a standard of dichotomizing families as responders or non-responders. So a reviewer said, I bet you'll find that um, clinic-based PCIT beats internet-delivered PCIT if you go to the more extreme point of an um, excellent responder. So an excellent responder is where the independent evaluator who doesn't know what condition the kid's in uh, identifies the, the uh, patient as very much improved. 
And so we did that, and um, we actually found that internet uh, PCIT um, significantly beat clinic-based PCIT when you're talking about rates of excellent responders. <laughs> so this was, you know, when we went into this, we were thinking it would be great to be comparable with clinic-based PCIT, or at least, um, you know, for 75% as good or for 50% as good. And then it actually turned out that there would seem to be some clinical advantage to treating families in their home. So that's where we started thinking about more ecological validity, treating people in their natural settings, you know, live coaching families in their own homes, how to navigate timeout sequences, how to um, uh, positively attend to their child and build a more warm and positive, um, mutually reinforcing relationship in their own home in natural settings. Here are some, you know, if you look at, um, you know, uh, growth curves across time in terms of ECB intensity, that's uh, basically behavior problems. Uh, here is uh, physical punishment when we look at parenting practices. And then we also found that um, families reporting on their perceived barriers to care uh, when they received internet delivered PCIT reported significantly fewer barriers to care. That's talking about things like scheduling, um, ease of, you know, how engaging, how easy it was for them to engage in the, the um, treatment, how acceptable did they find it, keeping appointments, um, parking obviously was better. Um, so that was sort of an easy item to get some points for, but um, we saw a significant um, advantage for internet delivered PCIT in terms of um, perceived barriers to care. So then, uh, as a next study, um, Dan Wagner is in the back of the room, uh, he had uh, uh, done a RCT looking at PCIT for kids with developmental delay. I had done this study looking at internet delivered uh, PCIT. Uh, so we put those together and um, had this RCT looking at internet delivered PCIT for kids with developmental delay. So <clears throat> whereas the first one was a pilot study, uh, this was an adequately sized um, randomized control trial. And we we're interested less in um, sort of this proof of concept where you know, we we're comparing people to internet versus clinic in the first one, but a, a separate piece of that was they had to be able to come to the clinic so we couldn't treat someone that was seven hours away because if they were randomized to clinic-based treatment, then obviously they'd have to drop out or wouldn't be able to engage. So this was more of a um, front, you know, a sort of routine practice um, uh, test um, out in the community with, with families that were naturally um, presenting as opposed to more of sort of in an, um, Department of Arts and Sciences posting signs and things like that. So um, recruiting, uh, the recruiting was out of when people were exiting their early intervention, uh, 150, and we were um, randomizing people to either get um, internet delivered PCIT or treatment as usual. Um, I could scare Dan right now and say, and here are the results, um, but uh, we're actually meeting after this to go over the results. But um, <laughs> the, um, uh, so originally we called this parental direction over the internet for developmentally delayed youth. So, these were, um, we were providing parental direction over the internet and just happened to have this really nice acronym. Um, so it was P. Diddy and we figured, you know, he, I think he lives in Miami and we're always trying to look for donor money. Um, but um, we thought, we, you know, we wanted people to take it seriously. So uh, we call this the uh, Advancing Child Competencies uh, by Extending uh, Supported Services. So this is the Access Project, if you've been hearing about it at the center. Um, you know, we, we um, most of my clinic works with kids with anxiety disorders, so uh, we have the ICOM program. We just finished a waitlist randomized trial looking at internet delivered parent coaching for um, young kids with, with anxiety. Here we're, um, instead of navigating timeouts, we're live coaching parents in being an exposure therapist for their own child. So um, having parents help their children approach feared uh, situations. Uh, feared settings um, and, and providing a, a structured reinfor social reinforcement system there. Uh, this was a, a waitlist controlled trial um, and <laughs> you can see um, at post-treatment and six month follow-up uh, we, we found uh, uh, kids were significantly improved uh, overall. Uh, when we looked at moderators we found um, that baseline fam family accommodation moderated uh, the effect. So family accommodation with child anxiety we're always talking about how um, it's not the cause of child anxiety, but family accommodation can certainly maintain and exacerbate child anxiety. Parents often are pulled in to rescue kids uh, uh, from experiencing distress. So kid doesn't want to um, go to uh, 
you know, uh, talk to a, a store person who, um, who asked them a question and the parent asked answers for them. Or, um, you know, we see in extreme versions, kids with separation anxiety disorder, their parents pull them out of school. And, and you know, uh, before COVID, when, you know, homeschooling wasn't uh, as realistic an option, parents taking, you know, off from work, uh, quitting their jobs so that they could homeschool their children. So we found here that um, families with more extensive um, patterns of family accommodation, uh, having the internet delivered program, uh, uh, it resulted in more steep uh, reductions in anxiety related impairment and parental depression. So that was exciting too. It sort of adds to our thinking about um, with cases where it's really a whole household process, um, providing treatment directly in the home can have specific advantages. And um, of course, satisfaction ratings are are very important too. In addition to, uh, you know, scales and, and symptoms that that as researchers sometimes we get too focused on. Uh, some other programs and and basically, um, you know, the findings are all very similar. Um, so before the pandemic, um, there were the two main obstacles to telehealth: uh, reimbursement issues and liability issues. So reimbursement issues, most uh, insurers did not pay for um, internet delivered care or telehealth. So um, the only two sort of populations that were able to receive uh, telehealth services were people paying out of pocket, which is a very small and skewed uh, uh, proportion of the, the uh, larger population of people in need, or people who were receiving services either as part of research trials, so it wasn't costing them, or people who were receiving um, services as part of um, uh, services at agencies that received contracts to work with families that weren't paying at a per patient level. So it put telehealth out of reach before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic happened, uh, there were uh, very rapid policy changes uh, that, that addressed that. So we saw an emergency order put in place um, one month into the pandemic or a few weeks into the pandemic at the federal and state levels that um, mandated that insurers um, reimburse for telehealth. And so the idea was it was important to um, have continuity of care for people who were already in treatment. And there was such a enormous mental health, uh, new mental health burden, given the, the stressors associated with, with COVID and, and associated disruptions. So, uh, so that was one thing the government, federal and state governments did to facilitate um, telehealth uh, as a way to provide continuity of care. And then another key change was um, that the federal government um, waived, as an emergency order, waived penalties against clinicians uh, for unintentional confidentiality breaches. So <laughs> a lot of clinicians would love to do telehealth before the pandemic, but uh, if they, um, uh, they're worried, what if I'm using a third party platform and um, there's a confidentiality breach, it wasn't my fault, but I picked the wrong platform, I might be you know, in financial ruin or pr professional ruin ethics charges. So these were both waived. Now importantly, these are still under emergency orders. So people have gotten very comfortable with telehealth. And you know, at this point, we're allowed to use um, consumer grade. You, know, you can use FaceTime if you're doing it in good faith for the continuity of care during the pandemic. But we don't know how long this is going to last. And so people should, uh, that have gotten very comfortable with telehealth should make sure that they're um, practicing in ways that um, will likely uh, withstand in terms of policy after um, the world, I guess, gets a little more normal. Um, so yeah, so right when the pandemic started, this was sort of like every therapist. Um, I guess I'm a teletherapist now as the only way to, to reach patients or to, um, uh, to stay in practice. Um, you know, the PCIT-based um, uh, treatments sort of had a, a leap start because so much uh, research had been done uh, on how to do internet-delivered PCIT and, and documenting um, favorable outcomes associated. So, um, so that, that was um, encouraging for families with young children. When we think about telehealth, um, so Addie Timmons, is, I don't, is Addie here? I don't mean to call her out if she's not here. But um, she and I uh, wrote this paper together, um, really looking at um, you know, one of the critiques of, of telehealth is, uh, does this um, reduce the, the alliance, the process, the rapport of psychotherapy? Um, uh, does it reduce empathy from the, the therapist for the patient? Um, and these are important questions. 
And we sort of took the, the angle that maybe there's a, a, the opposite is true, that you know, when we're treating people in our offices, they're getting a really good contextual dose of our professional lives. They know what the temperature is like in our office. They know how we decorate our office. They know how much noise is outside our offices, you know, what the mood is of people walking around the hallways of our offices. Um, and we, the only information we get about their lives is what they tell us verbally. When we're doing technology-based care, if we're doing sort of live parent coaching, we can hear the sirens uh, going, going on over and over in the background. We can hear the sibling baby crying the whole time. We see the spouse not even helping um, with the crying baby. Um, we, the phone's ringing. So it's a real dose of their, you know, we're really seeing in a mediated way the, the world through our patient's eyes, so to speak. And technology is even getting to the point where they have these things where you can see through someone's eyes. That's a whole other talk of how that'll possibly work into um, treatment. But um, it's something to think about. Um, is there sort of an augmented empathy? It's clunkier. Sometimes it's more distracting and disruptive to treatment. But you're also getting a, um, a wider dose of um, contextual input on, on our families' lives, which, as we know, is, is so important for, for um, understanding and helping our patients. <laughs> Something critical to think about uh, technology, the, um, you know, the rhetoric of um, technology-based care is all about the promise and potential, uh, but in some ways we're overcoming old obstacles but encountering new ones. So the licensure and jurisdiction issues we, you know, with COVID were sort of bypassed at least for now. Um, the home is an unsupervised setting. So if you're working with a family and they're eight hours away and you start seeing maltreatment, um, you know, you're eight hours away. If um, someone is other ways in which patients are high risk, it's concerning as well. So those, those issues need to be thought through. Um, we shouldn't think of home settings as supervised settings. Um, biller and paying issues we've talked about, but we don't know what's gonna remain. Um, tech literacy divides. Um, so people have access to technology, but some people um, uh, are, you know, use technology every day throughout the day and other people you know, might log on once a week or so, uh, how much it's incorporated in their lives. Cross-cultural issues are critical when we think about technology-based care. So um, some of the original uh, wave of um, advances in, in telehealth were uh, working with uh, people in tribal nations and the American Indian population. And all of a sudden, um, technically, uh, providers were able to reach these new populations. But just because you can reach new populations doesn't mean you have the experience with the populations. The, um, the understanding of the cultural background and how this work is gonna fit within their larger help-seeking behavior and help-seeking attitudes. So issues of cross-cultural uh, competency and, and cultural humility are um, really accentuated when we think about technology-based care because we're reaching new populations uh, that are, can even be a step further from being able, uh, from the, the families that we might usually work with in our own offices. And this critical thing that I keep thinking about and is really the biggest critique right now of telehealth is are we just reaching the same people? So the rhetoric of telehealth is we're reaching new people, we can reach new people, oh, the geographic barriers we can take care of and we can reach new populations. But if we look at the epidemiologic research on what happened during COVID, um, from one lens, it was, um, it was amazing. It was sort of the first test of you know, wide-scale telehealth rollout. Um, it provided continuity of care. But continuity of care was never the, the finish line for telehealth. We were not reaching new people who never uh, accessed the mental health care system before. So we need to be figuring out how can we reach um, new populations and really use technology um, in all the ways that, um, uh, that we can. Um, I'm gonna sort of uh, rush through the uh, this, the treatment or the uh, literature on standalone no therapist involvement because long story short, research shows that it doesn't work. Um, so, you know, we all have a million apps in our phone that seem like a good idea to download at the time. Um, and then, um, you know, you never used it again. So m mental health apps are the exact same. Uh, you know, people download them, they don't use them. Uh, interestingly, this is um, the largest uh, increase, you know, in terms of um, new studies, we're seeing a huge jump in people studying um, 
self-administered uh, program. So the research is showing that there's a real need for some human, uh, what's sometimes called supportive accountability. A coach, minimal therapist involvement, it doesn't need to be you know, someone who has 40 years experience as a clinical psychologist, um, but uh, technology-based coaches, supports, um, and there's newer research trying to understand does that even need to be um, you know, synchronous, real-time, could that be asynchronous, could that be a, a text-based um, support? Um, uh, I'll skip through this. this is, we, we evaluated the apps uh, for child anxiety and we found um, you know, they weren't, um, the apps on the, the consumer marketplace were um, uh, not um, containing the evidence-based content that we uh, in, in clinical science would, would see as essential within the apps. So uh, one question is whether there's too many apps or too few apps being used. Uh, so you look at the marketplace and there's just thousands and thousands of apps, but really the top four account for 90% of the traffic. So you know everyone's using Calm and Headspace and a couple other programs. Um, and then outside of that, they're not really having a public health impact. They're not making a dent either. So it seems that standalone apps and no therapist involved inter interventions um, uh, are, not, um, are not effective, although that's sort of the easiest thing to just roll out, put it on the marketplace. Um, so then comes minimal therapist involvement, which is sort of like the in-between ground of full therapist involvement, but that's gonna be very uh, resource um, intensive and um, no therapist involvement, um, which is too good to be true and, and it seems to be. Uh, I'll give a plug to uh, Dana and my uh, study, uh, where it's a multi-site study, where we're doing this, it's the Kids Face Fears Project, um, and this is a multi-site uh, comparative effectiveness trial, um, looking at self-administered treatment with minimal therapist involvement versus therapist-led treatment, and because of COVID, most of that has been um, telehealth. Um, so that's also um, patients presenting in pediatric health settings. Another study, I don't have results for you today. Um, so, uh, you know, where uh, digital interventions are headed that are not sort of synchronous uh, is this digital therapeutics model, which is a prescription-based model that uh, is, is requiring FDA approval. So instead of all of the apps that you see in the consumer marketplace, this is prescription-based apps, and these are very expensive. These are not, um, you know, like the $199, $299, download, um, this is $40 a month or $30 a month or, you know, and um, they're starting to get FDA approval um, and the FDA approval process is um, uh, very uh, imperfect and sometimes it's which, uh, um, which uh, you know, who in industry has the money to, to submit for approval, it's very expensive. Um, the other thing to be very cautious of, uh, you know, most of the people in this room are, are either clinical psychologists or training to be clinical psychologists, is within FDA approved apps, um, they're prescription based, and um, the way it's interpreted right now is uh, who is able to prescribe digital therapeutics are the same people who are able to prescribe pharmaceuticals. So um, it, it sort of brings up the question about prescriptive authority um, this is our science. So this is not like pharmacology where we're saying, well, we haven't gone to medical school or nursing school, so of course maybe we shouldn't be prescribing medicine. Um, these apps are based on behavioral science, psychological science, and right now, psychologists, not to get into too much guild issues, but psychologists are not able to be prescribing the apps based on our science. So the whole point of digital therapeutics, or one of them, is that we're expanding the reach of care but in fact, a very small proportion of people getting, receiving mental health care are receiving mental health care from someone who would be able to prescribe uh, digital therapeutic care. So these are issues that really need to be worked out. Uh, we may be actually closing um, the accessibility and making it harder. Uh, looking ahead, um, you know, we think about the evolving role of technology. Uh, so much of the conversation and, and the innovations with um, technology-based treatments has been focused on starting with what do we know works in the clinic and then can we replicate it? Uh, can we copy it um, over technology? And that's gotten us as far as we've gotten, I think, uh, with the exception of, of um, reaching new populations, but it's also put a ceiling on the conversation we're having and, and prevented us from, from thinking outside the box. Um, 
So technology's gotten so good now that instead of just saying, can we replicate what works in the clinic, we're getting to a point where we can do things with technology that we can't replicate in the clinic. And that's a good thing because maybe there are different lanes for different types of treatments and, and maybe we should, you know, so we want to make sure that we're um, uh, definitely thinking through um, all that we can do with technology and not just um, ending our considerations with what we've already learned in clinic-based treatment. So examples of this are, um, you know, advances and in innovations that are leveraging sensors and wearables and implantables. Um, we live in the age of the, the quantified self um, where we can track everything and we can gamify it and visualize it and analyze it, have personalized infographics. And um, so this is the age we live in and, and people are starting to think about um, how can we um, harness that for um, providing new mental health options. Um, so JEDIs are just-in-time adaptive interventions. Um, so these are pro uh, programs that provide micro supports um, to individuals whenever and wherever uh, they need help. So the whole idea here is it's sort of in situ. We're providing supports throughout the day. Uh, in the moment, a classic example is, um, you know, if there's a, a program that uses passive sensing to identify when you've been sedentary for too long. And if you've been sitting for over 45 minutes or an hour, you know, you might get a, what, what's called like a micro support, you might get a ping that says, you know, stand up and get a glass of water or do 10 jumping jacks or something, you know, take a run around the block, you can sort of individualize it. But um, these are sort of ecological momentary micro supports. And so with physical activity and uh, with GPS data and things like that, it's very easy to do that. So the next wave is, um, can passive sensors detect psychological states? Um, and that's a, um, uh, sort of a question we don't know yet. Um, and the thinking is we're starting to get there, um, but, but we don't know that yet. So, um, and then there's a picture of Addie Timmons with fake sunglasses on. I made her glasses sunglasses because um, she's uh, doing a lot of that work with Jedi's and uh, collaborating with her and, and some exciting stuff. Uh, people in this room are probably working with her on some of that stuff. So in summary, we have really strong support for real-time telehealth. Um, Sometimes real-time telehealth, when delivered in natural settings, can actually outperform traditional clinic-based care, but it does introduce new obstacles, um, and there's still issues of licensure, privacy, security, risk that we need to work out, and also we want to make sure we're not just reaching the same people. That's sort of the main um, uh, uh, front that we want to be uh, putting our efforts in now. Uh, with mHealth, here we're talking about more apps. Um, apps with support rarely penetrate the marketplace, and then the widely available apps um, often lack support. And there's a real need for minimal therapist involvement. There needs to be some uh, amount of um, coaching um, to uh, work with motivation and engagement and accountability. Um, and this digital therapeutics model, which entails FDA approval and um, is more prescription-based, and, and we talked about some, some concerning barriers there. Some concluding thoughts, um, there is, there, there's lots of support, but it's not a panacea. Um, and uh, uh, there's a sort of uh, mindset in the field that we need to get out of, and I very much with my clinical trials have um, you know, been guilty of this, but we need to broaden, we need to break out of this horse race mentality. Is technology as good as uh, clinic-based treatment or, you know, and we need to not think about the horse race mentality. We need to think about just broadening the portfolio of options and supports. And some supports are going to create large changes but only reach small numbers of people. And then other supports are going to make large changes and only reach small numbers of people. Wait. Sorry. If I said the same thing twice, reverse it in your head. But so some treatments are going to be uh, large, large impacts and small numbers of people. Some will be small impacts on large numbers of people. Um, and there's a lane for each of them. Uh, we need to be thinking about how can we broaden that portfolio. There'll always be a role for a human therapists. A lot of therapists get uncomfortable thinking about technology. Um, we're not replacing therapists, but augmenting therapists and creating efficiencies in our mental health care delivery. Um, and again, uh, we really need to make sure we're not just reaching the same people uh, as already. And as I mentioned, cultural divides are as important to consider as in any aspect of clinical psychology. Um, anytime we're able to reach new populations, we do need to um, make sure we're adequately trained and have the experience and the cultural humility to work with those populations. Another issue is technology changes fast and we need to stay agile. Things get outdated um, very quickly. Um, there was 
you know, NIMH put a fortune into uh, grants that focused on um, CD-ROMs for evidence-based treatment, and none of our devices can even uh, read a CD-ROM now. Um, and I'll stop there. I think we have a few minutes for, for questions, if anybody has any. Thanks. Yeah, so we do have a couple minutes for questions. Logan? I was thinking about like the barriers that technology like helps overcome, um, and knowing a lot of the therapists that have worked on these RCTs, I know that there can be a lot of significant efforts to like reschedule missed appointments or like Sunday afternoon sessions, and so which might not align completely with like if we were to like take one of these um, technological interventions into like a hospital setting and like the policies around like treatment attendants and no-shows mm -hmm. and things like that. So I'm wondering if you like think that like the findings would be as effective in a hospital setting or if there's any data that would suggest that like maybe it would be talking or things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so yeah, a lot of the, the studies that have been published to date have um, had the, you know, they've been really great proof of concept trials and allowed us to identify the, the efficacy that we could get, the potential um, efficacy. Uh, the uh, Kids Face Fears trial that I mentioned um, uh, with Dana um, looking at, um, that is in a real world hospital setting. I hate the, word, the term real world, but um, that is in a frontline routine practice setting uh, across different sites and uh, the, the providers are billing for services as they would in the natural billable healthcare system. Um, so we'll be able to analyze through that because in that study, even though I put the emphasis on um, minimal therapist involvement, 50% of the kids in that study are getting therapist-led treatment and because of the pandemic, it's all been um, telehealth. So we'll be able to look at those things. Um, usually the implementation studies don't have in this area have not uh, in, uh, looked at um, treatment response. So the outcomes they've been interested in has been acceptability, engagement, um, attendance, things like that. Um, therapist satisfaction, which are critical for, for seeing whether there'll be uptake on a large scale, but they haven't collected the individual patient outcome data um, that you can't get um, just from electronic uh, medical records. So um, it's an excellent question and it's a limitation of, of the research where it is right now. Yeah, Lindsay? Um, really interesting stuff. Uh, so I, got, I have, a, like you go, a couple of questions. But the first is, can you kind of address scalability, especially given the uh, kind of conclusion that a therapist, in some capacity, is always going to be necessary? Have you perhaps dismissed the uh, applicability of AI uh, in kind of the application of a, a standalone? procedures a little too early. And then you I liked how you kind of uh, talked about only, you know, are we reaching the same population? What are the solutions to not fall into that trap that you think of? Yeah, yeah. So excellent questions. Um, uh, a lot in there. The um, uh, yeah, so this research is based on yesterday's technology. Um, AI is getting better and better. Um, you know, um, you know, I think uh, now sometimes you're doing chat support with you know some, whether it's a cable company or whatever, your phone service. And it's like a long time before you realize that's not a person. Um, so AI is getting better and better. And um, you know, computational modeling is, you know, unlike any, the ability to process things in real time and use thousands of data points um, is, is brand new. So it's very possible um, that AI uh, will advance to a point where there is not that need for that human element. I think it won't be that there isn't that need. My guess is there'll be some sort of moderators that for some people, you know, some people, um, they like computers, they stigma related issues or who has time, they don't want to interact with a human being and they, they like, you know, um, that. And then other people are always going to um, be wanting that sort of human interaction. At least that's how it seems right now, you know, maybe in the not too distant future and Black Mirror and, you know, there's, um, you know, um, there's no need for that anymore. But um, yeah, I do think that we're getting um, close, I don't know, closer and closer, but, uh, you know, serious advances in 
AI seeming to be able to provide that, especially if we find that text-based support is sufficient for supportive accountability, um, you know, where you don't need to have synchronous, you know, um, interactions or, or, you know, with the human. Uh, and then you had another question in there? Like you kept mentioning, are we just reaching the same people? So what, what's the solution for that not to happen? Yeah, um, so excellent question. Um, I'm very curious on you know what what a lot of people think. I think our science has been um, anchored in a billable healthcare model, and that especially in the U.S. that model has not has failed um, a lot of uh, a lot of populations and subpopulations. So, if we put all our eggs in the basket of this is part of mental health care delivery as opposed to mental health supports, you know whether it's a consumer marketplace, whether it's supports that get um, sort of um, weaved into other aspects of people's lives and not just sort of billable healthcare, I think we'll be able to reach some more populations. Um, but that's, that's, a, that's what I'm, you know, my, I'm hoping a lot of my next research is trying to figure out um, and, and really center, um, you know, the intended end users in, in evaluating what's going to work best as opposed to sort of a top-down, or not a top-down, but an investigator-centered model that says, here's a cool innovation, um, does it work? Um, and really think about what people are wanting and how they want to use technology, if they want to use technology. John, thank you for this very fascinating talk. Uh, I was thinking about the, uh, the findings you reported where if there is no therapist at all, the effects are not very good. But I'm also thinking that you mentioned that most apps don't have evidence-based components. So I was wondering how much of the effect is due to not having a therapist and how much of it is due to their not just just being not having effective components and in particular i'm thinking about some of the single session work by jessica schleider and yeah you know like maybe if you know do you think if the or are there data showing that if the interventions have evidence-based components it will, it will, you know, it'll work yeah yeah that's a great point that the um you're, you're saying that there's a compound there where the self-administered apps at a um, sort of overall level are um, don't have evidence-based content and the findings are. So um, I, think, I think that's a great point. I also think that the majority of research that's finding that these things aren't working or at least no one's using them, I think is probably the better way to put it, um, is um, those are on investigator or academic apps that have the right components, right? So um, those are often uh, you know, research grant funded studies as opposed to, um, so the, there's like two sort of literatures and it'd be really cool to, to intersect them, but there's one which is saying, what's on the consumer marketplace? Go to the Google App Store, or iTunes, whatever, um, and, and, and say, what are people using? And those, um, that's where we find that there's no evidence-based content. Um, within investig you know, the, there's this sort of tradition of investigators developing apps, testing them, uh, no therapist involvement, and that's, so there we know they have the evidence-based components, but um, you know, we don't have the sort of, how much is this actually penetrating the marketplace, or, or not just the marketplace, but you know, the public health uh, need there. So, um, but it'd be really cool to, if someone were to test what's on the marketplace, um, because there's sort of two different questions, but it seems like they should overlap, so. It seems there's a, like there's a related compound then, because the apps that are developed by investigators are often really clunky and horrible. Mm -hmm. And you're saying it's not that they don't work, it's that people don't use them, so right. I, I think, I think she's on the right track. Yeah, yeah. Something sort of at a different level. Yeah. That's confounding that interpretation. Yeah, there hasn't been enough like partnership between the industry and academia, right? So the academics know what components are supposed to be in there. And I take a step back from that because, as I said, we sort of have the ceiling on um, saying what's supposed to be there is what works in the clinic. But we don't know if that's going to be the same stuff that's going to work. Um, so there's a limit on how far, I guess, um, you know, uh, one should be saying that it doesn't have evidence-based content. And then, um, you know, industry knows how to make slick products. They know how to make things usable, how to get, you know, people to, um, uh, you know, reuse things and add gamification and things like that. So, um, you know, it's often not financially uh, helpful for people in industry to collaborate with academia, and it's often not um, professionally as useful for, you know, or even it's out of reach sometimes for people in uh, academia to partner with industry that can sort of um, move forward without them. So I'd love to continue the conversation. Does there need to be regulation? I mean, so it seems like 
we're in a period that you're accumulating a lot of data, and the more data you have, the probably better treatment you'll be able to kind of uh, provide through these telehealth mechanisms. But we're also in a period where that data is certainly misused uh, pretty pervasively, and uh, I can imagine this even going quite awry. Is there a period, should we say, while it can increase reach, it's problematic on these other ethical reasons, and we shouldn't do it for that? Um, can you uh, sort of restate that? Uh, so are you talking about telehealth, where like synchronous real-time yeah, video conferencing? Well, or? Not telehealth, not, okay. not the synchronous, but I'm thinking like the, the next level mm -hmm. uh, that you kind of alluded to. Yeah. And, like that seems like collecting a ton of data, mm -hmm. and it certainly could be useful, but it could also be misused or uh, potentially problematic. And so yeah. should we start crossing, going down that road and then go, oh crap. Uh, oh no. Yeah. So I definitely think, so it's interesting because we, we actually have the same problem in clinic-based treatment, right? There's a lot of stuff that's not helpful, sometimes iatrogenic and makes people worse. Um, and there's very, uh, there are a lot of challenges the field has experienced and try to, you know, um, uh, take away uh, provider autonomy and um, regulate what can be delivered in the clinic and things like that. And then of course, as we know, you could list everything on your website and be, oh, they're doing the right things, and then, um, but you have a session with them and, and none of the key ingredients are there. Um, in terms of um, regulation, what's interesting is regulation's clunky, and right now the, the um, digital therapeutics model, which is the prescription-based model, um, there are um, a handful now, and it's gonna grow, uh, of uh, digital therapeutics that have received formal FDA approval. And it, many of them, um, those of you who um, study ADHD, uh, I don't know, I, I forget the name of the, the one that got FDA approval, but what's that? Well, anyway, uh, the one got FDA approval and um, it, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, my understanding is the entire uh, scientific community uh, focused on ADHD is appalled that this would get approval because there's no evidence uh, you know, I think the FDA process is often about a, um, it's so expensive to put forward that, you know, very few can, can withstand, you know, undergo the process. So we have these sort of, a, so that it sounds like it's the right thing to do to have FDA approval and all of that. And yet um, the process we have so far, which has not involved any psychologists, um, has resulted in some really questionable things. The few that are FDA approved, um, having questionable um, uh, content. Uh, so it's a game. Um, it's, I forget exactly how it works, but yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, Bill? Yeah, I just want to say FDA approval for devices, not like drugs. For drugs, you have to show they work. Right. For devices, you only have to show that they don't hurt the person who's using it. Not right, and pay a fortune to, to show that. Yeah, so um, the one ADHD, uh, digital device that has approval is, you know, is not coming out of um, research on what helps kids with ADHD. So, um, so I think in principle, yes, and then in practice, it always seems to um, fail us. So I'm not sure exactly, but I don't think the right people are at the table um, because the people at the table are often representing um, varied interests that, that don't always seem to be with treatment outcome. Lindsay? I saw this like during I think Thanksgiving they have like right hands that can track it basically is a camera on your sunglasses. Mm -hmm. Where do you see that being used in treatment? And I think this kind of gets at his question of like invasiveness, how much data are we collecting to where that could be a problem? So someone's in their house and you see that it's tracking data and you see someone getting abused and that affects then multiple people outside of the patient that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. So you're uh the, the question is about um, invasiveness and privacy and privacy of people who are not even in, um, in, in treatment. Like, where do we see that specific? Because you hinted at that being um, the start of like a new era. Like, mm -hmm. Where do you see that headed? Yeah, um, so that's not something that I'm doing, but um, the, 
so I guess something could be that you have a parent coaching model where your parents have Bluetooth earpiece and um, rather than sort of having a sort of bird's eye view on the room, you're seeing everything, you know, a classroom based intervention, right? If there's teachers getting supports and seeing things from the teacher's perspective, um, you know, I, I haven't thought it through as much as to know that that's sort of, um, you know, it's sort of technology on the horizon um, and, you know, I'm sure uh, people will start thinking about how to use it, but um, um, you know there are all different ways that we can get live eyes and data on people's um, everyday moment-to-moment -moment lives, whether it's um, physiological data, whether it's what they're seeing out of their view. Um, there's just more data than we know what to do with right now, and there's more data than we know is useful, right? Um, and that's sort of a lot of the big challenges of some of the AI stuff. Um, you know, what's signal and what's noise, so. All right, well, uh, thank you so much.